Awesome. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, family. You guys fired up to hear the word of God? Is your hearts prepared for the word of God this morning? Amen. Well, I have the privilege of introducing an incredible, awesome, spiritual man of God, and that's Michael Peterson. Amen. And he reigns all the way from the Living Waters House Church. And he's also one of my best friends in the kingdom of God. Um, I'm excited to hear Michael preach to us this morning. You know, he was telling me, he said, bro, as I was finishing up my lesson, you know, when you, when you get to that last section that really convicts your heart, he said, God just, just put a dagger in his heart this morning. So I'm excited to get some daggers myself from the word of God, and I hope you are as well this morning. So at this time, guys, let's give our hearts, let's give Michael some amens, let's give him some hallelujahs, and let's encourage our brother as he preaches the word to us this morning. I give you Michael Peterson. Good morning, family. I just want to first thank Aaron and Sheila for giving me this opportunity to share in this place today. Now, preaching can very much so feel like a monologue when the audience is dead, amen? So what I need is a conversation to happen this morning. When I speak, I need you to speak, amen? If something touches you on the inside, it's okay to shout. Okay, it's okay to give me a mmm, yes, come on. Praise his name, hallelujah, ha! That's okay, because that means that God is working and the word of God is alive this morning. Now, I actually initiated with a lot of you, a lot of you probably received a random text message from me this week asking if you could hear a sermon this Sunday on repentance or character, what would you like to hear? And I did that specifically because I want us to take ownership of this region. That it, this is, yes, there are leaders, but this is God's church, and through God, this is our church, amen? And we have to get our needs met here. And nine out of ten people said, bro, I need you to preach on character. And so that is exactly what I choose. Now, it's interesting because I am a man who loves, loves, loves character. This is one of my favorite conversation topics. If you know me, you know that if, if you ask me, what do you like to do in your free time? I like to plan. I like to plan. I like to color coordinate my planning. I get joy. I have about 15 gel pens that are, are, are my second best friends, right? It's God, my wife, the church, planning. Because <laughs> I love it because if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And I just believe so much that character is the lifeblood of any kind of successful anything that exists in this world. And it's, some, it's interesting because repentance is something given by God, and yet character is built by the hands of men. You see, character is the art form in which you take your brush and paint a beautiful masterpiece of skill sets and abilities, where you show the world what you are made of. You see, everyone wants the benefits of character, but not many want to build it. Building character is excruciating. It takes grit and fortitude. It requires a relentless spirit. You see, the Bible is the gospel truth, but it is also a collection of stories of men and women who had character and those who did not. You see, today I invite you into this journey, and today's lesson is titled, The Character of a Champion. Point number one, the mind of a champion. You see, man can alter his entire infrastructure through his mind. In today's world, we see these overnight successes when really the reality is no, there's no such thing as overnight success. There's a rarity. But we see on Instagram and Facebook, we just see all these people taking off and all of a sudden they have all this money because they're getting all these views. And we become disillusioned to character. We're, I just need that one thing that's going to make me a million dollars. I just have to try this one thing. And yet you get so disillusioned to the fact that if you want something that will last, it must have character as the foundation. You see, because talent will take you to a place where your character can't keep you. And so you must have the mind of a champion. 
You see, it is not the opportunities that corrupt a man, but a corrupted man that happens to get an opportunity. You see, I, give you, I can give you two different men, and each of them can be given a million dollars. They can have the same socioeconomic status, same education, and yet make two different decisions based upon how they view what they have gotten. It is in the mind, the lens of your life that can be changed and shifted. Because if you don't know no better, you won't do no better. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans 12 too. You see, I have become transfixed and obsessed with never remaining the same Michael. Every day I take a self-assessment. Michael, how can we be better tomorrow? What can we change? And the, the interesting thing is, and that it always seems to come down to my perception. Come on, bro. How am I viewing it? Because we can become so obsessed with it. What can I do differently instead of how can I be different? In Romans 12, 2, the Bible reads, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, I'm not stretching the Bible. Transformation lies within the mind, but not simply the, re the mind, the renewed mind. And so if you want transformation and change and repentance, you must change how you think. And you don't have the power to change how you think. The power to change how you think lies in the word of God. You see, so many people have said, man, your church brainwashes people. Well, guess what? My mind had a little bit of dirt on it and it needed some washing. So if y'all are brainwashing and, and, the, and that bar of soap says Bible on it, then keep on scrubbing. My mind needed to be transformed by the renewal from the Bible. Because how I view things, my perception was completely worldly, which means absent of God. How can you think like God when you don't even know God? But people want pieces of God. They want the benefits. Man, God's love is so amazing. But what about your love? You, you want everything from God, but you're not willing to imitate God. Because of how you view it, you think that you are just a receiver and a benefactor of God's love, but you're not a participant. And therefore, you will never experience true transformation because your mind is dirty. So if you desire transformation, you must be renewed mentally. And that lies in the scriptures. Let's turn our Bibles to Luke 18. You see, because it is not an easy thing to simply change. And if anyone has truly tried to change, you can say amen. amen. Sometimes it seems like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. By Saturday, I'm not doing this no more. This is difficult. Because I, I walk in and I'm like, okay, today I'm not going to let anything bother me. Okay, first off, that's just a bad, bad choice. Because <laughs> something's going to bother you. Like, I'm not going to let anything ruin my mood. It's Monday, but I'm going to have a great day. You walk into work, you say, hey, everyone. They give you a weird look and you're just like, I just don't even understand why people do that. I walked in, I'm trying to have a good day and you're just ruining my, I'm not going to let. And so <laughs> that is a bad, you got to have some realism in your goals. But you have to maintain the mindset that you will not let anything overcome you. And in Luke 18, verse 1, it is the parable of the persistent widow. Can you learn from an older woman today? It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I do not fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she will eventually won't come and attack me. 
And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? You see, by the time you have exhausted your internal resources, you feel like quitting. Because in your heart, you don't really believe that you could change. And so you keep trying to do things differently and do things differently instead of being different. Which begins in your mind. You see this woman who was a widow. We know that a widow, her husband had died. She was alone. And yet she was relentless in her spirit. She said, grant me justice. You see, there's a thing that lives inside of you known as your flesh. And it will never quit. It is actually defined in Greek as sarx, which means man's fallen disposition that lives in opposition to God. You can never get rid of it. And yet you can learn to overcome it by imitating this widow. Day in and day out. Because the reality is, is that your heart is simply a reflection of what you've allowed your mind to sit and meditate on. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs 27, 19. And so I've sat inside myself multiple times thinking, how can I change? How can I shift? How can I adjust? Because the reality is, at 27 years old, I've only been a disciple for six and a half years. So that other 21 years, I spent a whole lifetime of not doing what God told me to do. And so then I get married, and then I become a father. And you realize, if you have come from a broken home, you best believe you have broken thought patterns. You have a broken way of viewing things. And so I've spent years trying to figure out every single day how I can amend and adjust my perspective to have a kingdom mindset and how to view my role and position in my marriage and as a father. Because life didn't teach me the correct philosophy. And so I have to constantly sit there and consider, am I, am I being the right thing? Am I allowing certain thoughts to sit there and just sit there and tell me these untruths that do not agree with the Bible? I'm still turning. I'm sorry. I got caught up in talking. Proverbs 27, 19. The Bible reads, as water reflects the face, so one's life reflects the heart. And so your life will tell people what lies in your heart. And yet your heart is a byproduct of your mind. You see, your mind is a farmer and your heart and your soul are the soil. And so if I was a farmer and I had land and I had been planting certain seeds, after a certain time, those seeds will bear a crop. And so as you start to change, you realize, i got to start using some different seeds. But you still have to realize that in the, in the land of your heart, there are still a crop of unbiblical seeds. And so as you start to plant new ones, you're still dealing with the old ones. And so you become discouraged because you have yet enough time for those, those new seeds to take up root. And so as you take one step forward, you feel like you're taking three back because you're planting seeds, but you're still dealing with the old ones. But you have to be persistent and understanding that eventually this crop will die and the new one will come and take up root. And so if I continue to transform and renew my mind, then my heart and my life will be corresponding to what I've been thinking. But it's a process, right? And your character is exposed in the midst of that process. Are you really a quitter on the inside? Because your life will, t- will speak enough for you. You can tell all day from the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. The, but the reality is intentions sometimes don't equate to much. Because one of my favorite quotes says, the gateway to hell is paved with good intentions. There's intentionality and then there's reality. And so a lot of us can communicate our intentions being completely disillusioned to the reality of what's going on. If you decide to be different right here, right now, you didn't decide that yesterday, so you still got to live out what you decided three months ago and two months ago and one month ago and two weeks ago. 
there has to be a wash cycle on your life. And then, in two months from now, in three months from now, in six months from now, you will reap the crop of the seeds that you planted today. You see, repent, repentance is instant, but that crop is not. And so do not be confused in your mind, Mitanoah, when you make that transformation where I'm going to agree with God, you agreeing with God doesn't take away the decisions that you've made. You just have to carry out that agreement and keep planting those seeds, good farmer. Because then, then, You'll be able to experience, and it's going to it's gonna be a lot, a lot, a lot of other thoughts popping up, trying to take hold of this new thought. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 10.4. Because there's going to be whispers in your heart, in your ear. You can't do this. See, you're, you're just like so-and-so. You know what? There's been so many times I've had to just have a sobriety and had to just acknowledge my lack of faith to God. God, I really, I want to believe I can change, but I don't. You see, we can spend so much time trying to fake ourselves out of where we're actually not. So if you're telling, if you're at a certain place and you know that you're at a certain place, but because your pride keeps you from really being able to acknowledge that place, you can never grow. How can you plant seeds in soil that you're trying to stay above? So you're just throwing seeds and they're not actually getting to anywhere because you're trying to tell yourself, well, I'm not actually that bad. I'm not that faithless. I don't like that much self-control. No, baby, you lack self-control. No, you are that faithless. And that is okay because God can work with someone who's humble enough to admit it. So you got to own where you're at. God, I, I don't have faith. Husbands, be considerate of your wives. I don't even know what that means, God. (laughs) Consider it. Consider it. I'm getting nothing. Complete. How do I do this? And I would sit, I don't be so confused. God, how do you, you expect me to do something I've never seen before? God, this is in Spanish and I need subtitles. I don't speak this language. But I had to apply myself to learning. I had to acknowledge, God, I don't have faith that I can be this man that you called me to be. And so in 2 Corinthians 10.4, I realized it was because I was trying to fight against myself with myself. And guess what? I I was failing. And yet in 2 Corinthians 10.4... The Bible reads, the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. You see, every thought that after that moment, and I decided here in my mind, you see, you have to have a fortitude and a relentlessness. I will not be this way. I don't care if it takes me one day, one week, one year, a decade. But in the end of that decade, I will be different. You have to make a decision inside yourself. And I have to realize, Michael, stop fighting you against you. It was God exposing my self-reliance. Because I wanted a little bit of God and a whole lot of me to be able to fix my problems. I didn't want to have to feel like I needed God as much as I did. And I had to just face God in my humanity. Man, God, I'm really, really, really not super anything. If anything, I'm super struggling. (laughs) Super weak, super self-reliant. And then when I acknowledged it before God and allowed God to teach me how to fight the way I needed to fight. Because in Psalms 119 verse 11, it says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. You see, whenever you memorize a song, you know the words by heart. And so if you can memorize Cardi B, you can memorize the Bible. Come on, Metro Heights. Y'all know y'all know Cardi B. If you wanted to, this and hmm, then red by, y'all know, y'all know the lyrics. I don't even know the lyrics, but one sister was like, this is blood shoes. <laughs> she knows the lyrics, but do you know your word, my sister? 
Do you know how to fight the temptations when they come in your heart and grab that good sword? Because I got to a point in my life where Satan would come and I was like, I don't know if you know, but the old Michael was evicted. And I ain't fighting like I used to fight no more. So you can come up here if you want to, but you're going to get this, this time. You're not getting old Michael. you getting the one that kicked you down. Because I'm fighting with him, and you already know what happened last time. See, you got you to gotta get some grit up inside you. I had to decide I'm not losing no more. You won a couple battles, but baby, the war is the Lord's, and I'm fighting for him. You have to be transfixed in your mind. See, sometimes we need to be a little bit more religious here. We got to be a little bit more connected to God. Sometimes we can, be, we can see stuff in the world and just want to run away from it because, oh, they, don't, they, they teach false doctrine. But in reality, they might be closer to God than you are. Because God knows their name because they pray on their face every morning. But you feel like, well, I know what it takes to be saved. I'm baptized. And you're proud, too. And, and my Bible says God opposes the proud. So how you feeling? Right? You cannot think that because, oh, well, I'm in this church and I was baptized. You're still in a fight. Because if you're baptized, then you know the real, real, real truth. And you know that just because you saved doesn't mean that you are always saved. Okay? Because you can still fall away, baby. Away. <laughs> I've seen people walk away from God and I don't even know who they are anymore. I was like, good God. But the thing is, I was like, I need to go get my life together because what I don't want is that to happen to me. Because if you don't clean the house, the demons are going to come with seven more. Y'all better know your word. Because that's the only thing keeping you here. And so you have to have the mindset of a champion. You see, one of my favorite movies is Lord of the Rings. And you think that sometimes you think champion, so you think big, strong, like a Goliath, like he's a champion. And yet, in Lord of the Rings, there's this little itty bitty man named Frodo, who had the mind of 10,000 men. And he took his little self and went across a land unknown, faced terrors, but he was convinced, I have to do this one thing. I have to destroy this ring. And people did not even know who this little man was. And he saved millions because he decided to be a champion in his mind. Are you a champion today? Because all it takes is choice. God has given you the power of your free will. And if you would harness it and take hold of the thing that God gave you, you could be different. In your mind, decide to be a champion here and now today. Point number two is the heart of a champion. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew 25, 14. Now, this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Because we're going to talk about character, character now. So, brothers, pull those, pull those big boy pants up. I'm coming for you. Matthew 25, 14, let me get an amen when you are there. The Bible reads, again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. Now, this is not a 2019 journey, right? We don't go on journeys, we go on trips. Trips are real quick. I'm gone for a week, two weeks. A biblical journey was I'm, I'm going to get this chariot and I'm, I'm going to go somewhere, and I'm going to come back. I might see you in a different season, a different year, maybe even a different decade. Because I got to go on this journey. So I want to give you a biblical lens. A journey is a long time. And entrusted his wealth to his servants in, while he was gone. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to one other one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey, and the man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. You see, these servants were given wealth, five, two, and one bags of gold, according to their ability. You see, I believe that I'm a one-bag man. 
oh, well, you can do X, Y, and Z. I was like, okay. So we have this thing in the kingdom where we're like, oh, that's a five-talent brother. That's a four-talent sister. Oh, she's a, that's a three-talent brother. Because it talks about the parable of the talents. But a talent is a gifting, right? An ability is a characteristic that's been honed in the fires of trials. You see, I can't give myself the gift of song. That's a gift from God. But ability is something that I can learn and work and hone in on. And so these servants were given five, two, and one according to their ability, what they could actually do. And so I'm looking back at this and I'm like, okay, so ability is defined as a possession of means or skill to do something. And a lot of us, I believe, might think that we're five or two, or even one. I'm just a one talent, I'm just a one talent guy. I'm a one bag of gold guy. Let's look at the heart responses of each servant. So the five that we read, he said, he went to immediately put them to work and gain five more. Verse 17, so also the one with two bags of gold gained two more, but the man who had received one bag went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned, right? Long journey. The man who had received five bags brought the other, Master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags. See, I gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. And then the one who had received one bag of gold came. Master, I knew you were a hard man, investing where you, harvesting where you had not sown and gathering where you had not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your gold into the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. So it's so interesting how many of us decide that when God gives us something, we become afraid. Not that, oh man, I don't know what to do with it, but we're just too lazy to figure out how to make that one bag become another bag. He said, you wicked, lazy servant. But the one that had two got two more, and the one that had five got five more because they were able to prove to God they had the character that could be trusted. You see, a lot of times people can look a certain way a perfect example is Saul. I wanted to go here in the scriptures, but I'm just going to reference the story really quickly. Saul was a head taller than everybody else. And the Bible even said he was handsome. So if you know the Bible says somebody handsome, they're a looker. And the, God was like, no, you need to put that in there. He was very handsome. <laughs> and so Saul looked the part, big, tall, handsome an appointed king, and yet within a chapter, he was disobedient. Because sometimes you want the allure of leadership, but your soul can't handle the authority. Because you have not built the character within yourself. So you give the opportunity to a corrupted man. It is not the opportunity that corrupts someone. It is the heart that they already have. And yet within a few chapters after that, God already has Saul's replacement, but he's found being a shepherd. Another scenario, Saul's disobedience, and then comes Goliath. And Saul as king should have been the first one on the field, but he's hiding in his tent. And a teenager has to come and do his job. And that teenager was chosen to replace Saul. And yet God allowed Saul to go through his kingship, and his heart to constantly be exposed. And yet Saul still had the choice. Saul could have repented at any moment in time. But see, some of us, God has given some of us five bags of gold, but we're intimidated with other people that have five around us. 
So we actually tell ourselves in our mind, well, I have five, but they, their five is only three. They don't even know what to do with their three bags. They don't even do with their five bags. Trying to invalidate themselves because of your own insecurity. Hello, Saul. So I had to ask you, if you feel like I've only gotten one bag, are you on time for work consistently? Are you a disciple in your work ethic? Do you have a Christian tongue while engaging in conversation with your coworkers? Do you serve your early earthly masters well? Are you reliable? Are you willing and able to serve whenever necessary, including when you don't feel like it? Are you self-motivated? Have you learned to lead yourself? Can you manage your household and affairs? Can you teach life skills you yourself have implemented. Do you work hard for the sake of working hard? Do you have to be reminded to do things that you know you need to do? Do you give to God what is due him or you, do you do it out of obligation? Are you a man or woman who gets advice? You see, these are the characteristics of someone who has character. Amen. You see, Saul looked like he could be trusted. You see, it's interesting, the word trustworthy means worthy of trust. Are you worthy to be trusted? Have you been able to show God? Because a lot of times you're like, oh, well, X, Y, and Z, you're looking at people, but God, Hebrews 4.13 says everything is laid bare before him to whom we must give an account. God sees everything. And so you see that it is up to us to display the heart posture. See, the kingdom is built on the backs of those who have shown God in the day-to-day -day circumstances that they have the ability to carry out his will and do something productive with his wealth. You see, God's grace and salvation are free, but it did cost somebody. And God gives to those the ability to carry it out. Now we, as disciples, have to decide, are we going to be the Davids or the Sauls of our day? Are we going to have the mind and the heart postures of those who are willing to serve God in the shadows? That they will catch you shepherding the flock to have to do the will of God because you're just so consumed with being that champion for God. Or are you trying to sit here and fight your way to the spotlight? Desiring for acclamation and acknowledgement. You see, I believe that today, right now, this entire room can make this decision to be different. And we are not going to see it tomorrow. But baby, by January 2020, I will know and we will know the decision that you made today. And I am with you guys. Because January 2020, you will see another new Michael as well. I love you guys so much. And to God be the glory.